The third topic was, that was selected, and will again, the presentation will be slightly different. Okay, it'll be presented by Dr. Alan Rabinowitz. Dr. Rabinowitz is a cardiologist and president of the medical staff at St. Paul's Hospital uh, here in Vancouver and clinical associate professor in the Division of Cardiology at the University of British Columbia. He's a co-founder of FEMI Health Systems and serves as chief medical officer and director on the board of the company. Dr. Rabinowitz received his medical degree from the University of Cape Town, South Africa, uh, completed his internal medicine and cardiology training at the University of Toronto, undertook subsequent training at the University of Toronto and, under, and uh, in cardiology at St. Paul's Hospital. Uh, Dr. Rabinowitz serves as a special advisor to uh, numerous medical institutions and organizations, both locally and globally, on medical innovation and systems improvement. In his previous capacity as director of the coronary care unit at St. Paul's Hospital, Dr. Rabinowitz recognized the critical importance of disruptive data solutions in transforming healthcare to enhance uh, patient research and innovation and improve sustainability of the healthcare ecosystem. This inspired the work that resulted in, in his uh, uh, entrepreneurial activities. He's going to go ahead and represent a very broad and diverse group that was put together around improving patients' health interventions, adherence using e-health and other technologies. This was not only the third most selected topic, but it was the top focused topic that you as CEOs selected for this. So Dr. Rabinowitz. Forward, back, pointer. Thanks very much, Bob, and, and it's really an honor to be able to participate in a forum like this. This is a, a very unique forum, as, as has been mentioned. It's very hard to get this diverse group of people into a room. It's very useful that, that this room is in a real hospital where we can actually do real things and get beyond um, conversation. Now, I just want to say as well that um, there are many people who uh, made contributions to this talk. Several of them could not be here today because they have travel schedules even more hectic than mine. But these include people like Adair Levin, who's um, head of the Renal Agency, Scott Lear, who's Pfizer Professor of uh, Cardiovascular Prevention, Andrew Cron, Head of Cardiology, and then many others. Um, Donna, uh, you, you made a contribution as well, and, and, and rheumatologist and, and whatnot. Um, my topic is improving patient's health intervention adherence using e-health and other technologies. Um, as you'll see, I, like many others here, wear several hats. That's not always an easy thing, because wearing a hat as an, uh, somebody attempting to innovate in the health system, somebody sometimes can be a very painful experience. Every time you stand up out of the proverbial box, sometimes refl uh, people reflexively try and shut the lid. And so that adds new meaning to the term banging your head. <laughs> um, in interest of uh, full disclosure, um, I, um, I am the co-founder and chief medical officer of, of, of FEMI Health Systems. Um, FEMI started off um, several years ago um, um, as a collaboration between a few cardiologists, both in Vancouver and as well at Toronto, the, the head of cardiology at the University of Toronto, Paul Dorian, um, working with a very um, um, innovative thinker called Gabe Heller. And we came up with this idea of, um, on behalf of physicians involved in a process of care, actually untrapping the data from the vast repositories with which we were uh, faced in the interest of efficiency uh, and, and improved outcomes. And we created this doctor robot, which we actually got to work, and then realized that a few doctors in a wheelbarrow couldn't actually get this thing off the ground to the level that, that it ought to. And then I was extremely fortunate to be introduced to Dr. Paul Terry, who uh, many of you might, in the audience might know, but for those of you who don't, he's sitting in the uh, third row here in his um, Sunday finery. I see it's salmon today, <laughs> Paul. <laughs> and um, Paul is, um, is, uh, is arguably one of the top data scientists um, in the world. But more than being a top data scientist, what, what Paul really taught us was the importance of taking an idea, which ultimately is really only 10% of the success of any project, to execution to success. 90% of that being focused on execution. And so Paul and his team, including Adam Laurent and John Seminario, um, have worked with us over the last two years, and it's been a fantastic experience and an eye-opener to the points that were raised earlier about how physicians like myself in the space understanding the problem from the points of view of the, of the grassroots can actually team up with best of breed in order to make something happen and take it beyond conversation. And so, Bob, with due respect to you, I don't know if it was you or if it was this audience who selected the topic, but I have to say that the thought when I was handed this topic of having yet another conversation about improving patient adherence, sitting in yet another forum, made my eyes glaze over. In fact, I fell asleep after drawing out the title slide. 
Um, because in actual fact, we in this hospital do things, and, and uh, as, as physicians, um, and I'll point out that, um, that the, the medical staff at, the, at, at this point in time is highly engaged in partnering not only with, um, with the institution, but also with patients along new paradigms of care. We're in action mode, and the train has already left the station. The question then is how we can all engage to, make that, to take that value proposition to a different level. So considering e-health, which is a, a very broad and all-encompassing term, um, the World Health Organization perhaps is the most useful source. E-health is the transfer of health resources and health care by electronic means. It encompasses delivery of health via internet and telecom. That's the obvious one. It also encompasses IT and e-commerce to improve uh, public health, perhaps along, along the lines of your presentation, Stephanie. But very importantly as well, it encompasses e-commerce and e-business in health systems management. And that's really where this forum provides the opportunity to move things uh, along to a totally different paradigm, and perhaps a unique paradigm, one that hasn't been done, done sufficiently well anywhere in the world. And needless to say, it's important for all of us, as taxpayers, as patients or potential patients, to be participating in this conversation because the problem is enormous at the current time. The cost to society is enormous at the current time, and it's only going to get worse, obviously, as the population ages. So to get back to this notion of um, a real-life example, uh, I'll walk you through this, um, this, this case. This is um, a photograph of Dr. John uh, Pavlovich, who's in the audience, and will join me, be joining me on the panel afterwards. John is um, a... Um, Associate Pre Professor in the Department of Family Practice at UBC, who is, also serves as a medical um, uh, chief of, the, um, of, of various First Nations groups, and has pioneered telemedicine in rural British Columbia in many, in many aspects. Um, so this is John um, um, landing um, in the, um, in, in the uh, Settleton First Nations um, community just west of Prince George um, uh, near Fraser Lake. Uh, where he was asked to see a 40-year-old man with a history of hypertension and, uh, and, and diabetes um, who had mild kidney failure and was developing symptoms very suggestive of progressive heart failure. Complex patient, young guy, working with, with, with two young kids. So John, who's done a lot of extra training in cardiology and worked closely with our group over the years doing so, um, did a fa fabulous workup and then involved a, an internist from St. Paul's Dr. Mary Pierre Delaire, who will also be joining me on this panel, hopefully, she's finished the ward rounds, who does outreach from St. Paul's into these small communities in British Columbia, and as a state of goal, is, is looking to um, develop telemedicine along those lines. They completed um, the, uh, the, the work as far as they could, and then I received a phone call from, from John asking me if we could help expedite care of this very complex patients through the, um, the rather complex um, heart center at St. Paul's Hospital. And for those of you who know this process, it can take several months or years. People travel up and down for, uh, from small communities into the urban center. It's no reflection on St. Paul's, it's just the way it has been um, in, in, in systems in general. And what we sought to do in this particular case was to expedite the process on behalf of this man who was still working and couldn't really afford the, the risk of lost productivity. So we set out to do it in a rather, as a, as a one-off for this to create a template on which we could work subsequently. And so um, we're able to um, we're able to expedite. Let's see if I guess the video wasn't uh, wasn't working. Able to expedite um, a high part of the echocardiogram dispatched to a community nearby, rather than having come down to St Paul's for the procedure. And this predictably showed very poor left ventricular function, which was after all was the was the cause of, of his heart failure. A fancy term applied to that is cardiomyopathy, just means a weak heart. And clearly, he needed to be worked up at this young age for potential cardiac transplant, but more importantly, because, particularly because he had a history of extra heartbeats or palpitations, needed to be monitored um, and considered for implantation of a cardioverted defibrillator. So the monitoring process, we were able to move away from the standard halter recording, which is a cumbersome device that has to be picked up and then delivered back and only gives 24 hours or perhaps 48 hours of monitoring. It's like going fishing, and often you don't catch the thing that you're looking for. This device, um, could be worn for two weeks. Um, it, people can shower with it, and not bathe with it, but shower with it. And then it's dispatched into the monitoring center, and the, and, and the, um, the results are sent to the referring physician in the form of a PDF. We considered an implantable 
or insertable uh, monitoring devices well, but it wasn't necessary in, in the final analysis because in any event, simply because of his poor heart function, he warranted insertion of a cardioverter defibrillator. And so rather than having come down for individual assessments by the pre-transplant heart failure group and the electrophysiology group separately, we worked with Amory Khan, who will also be joining me uh, on the panel, to expedite this entire process of evaluation right into the operating room uh, for a cardioverter defibrillator at St. Paul's Hospital. After which, with this device in place, he was able to return to his small community to continue to be monitored for events down the line. His diabetes was managed um, by Dr. Hugh Tildesley, who manages uh, multitudes of, of patients remotely from this institution. And in fact, his heart failure management was expedited and facilitated by Amory's um, virtual heart failure clinic um, website, which empowered the patient himself, but more importantly, perhaps, empowered people within his community to participate in his care in linkage with an expert center at St. Paul's Hospital. So this is a, an example of how, just uh, illustrated by, by, one, this, uh, by, by this one particular case, we were able to not only expedite access into a complex system, secondly, um, mitigate the expenditure that would otherwise have been required for travel back and forth into the urban center, a great penalty to the patient himself and to the taxpayer, um, and as well facilitate ongoing monitoring of his complex uh, conditions by an expert system. So it was Einstein who was famously quoted as saying that imagination is more important than knowledge uh, because knowledge is limited to what we know and understand today, whereas imagination embraces the entire world and embraces all the, um, um, the, the understanding um, and knowledge that, that would ever have. Um, and he's also quoted as saying that I fear the day that technology will surpass our human interaction the world will have a generation of idiots. And both these statements were prophetic. Uh, remember that, that's, that Einstein really lived before the uh, computer era, as we know it. Um, and he also predated um, certainly um, the internet and, and big data. Um, he also predated this deluge of um, either implantable or wearable technology which is very helpful as one contemplates the 4P paradigm of delivering healthcare, which is the way we ought to go. Let me make that absolutely plain. But as we do that, we run the risk of engaging um, a frenetic society of obsessive compulsive hypochondriacs <laughs> who will drive physicians crazy as they have already with their reams of paper uh, from the internet. Um, you know, so th so there's, th there's really a balance that has to be struck. And so there is a balance to be struck, not only between technology and the human, and the human face of, of medicine, um, which really speaks to the need to strike a balance between the art and the science of, of, of medicine, but it has to be done within a framework in which value is truly being added. And the best framework that I know of is the Institute for Health Improvement Framework of the Triple Aim, which refers to the experience of care on the one hand, and this is the experience, not only the outcomes, but the actual experience, including access to care, um, the health of the population, and the per capita cost. Um, looking at, at methodologies of, 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 of improving productivity, obviously, in order to help achieve that. And the best way to get to value, as has been alluded to up until now already, is data. And in a big data world, the conversation changes entirely. So big data has been around for a long time, perhaps 10 years or more. Um, invented by Google and, and Yahoo and the likes. It's been applied with great speed and accuracy to multiple industries, but not adequately to the healthcare industry, which yet again is a laggard in terms of adopting new ways of thinking. Big data, um, as one might not understand from the term itself, refers not only to, um, um, to the, the volume of data, which can be included, but also refers to the requirements around data velocity, and most importantly, data variety. So the, um, the, the loose structure or, or, or non-schema related structure of, of big data um, allows for rapid adaptation to changing business needs and changing, and changing requirements, which is a perfect scenario to be applied to the loop extender that we're talking about, telemedicine or, or e-health, which is just a loop extender of best practice real life delivery of care. And so within that, we can contemplate a world where we enable the delivery of genomic or omic-based um, um, care to a society of patients 
or people, persons, irrespective of where they happen to live and irrespective of how close they happen to be to the mothership, so to speak. And so, um, within the context of British Columbia, being the optimist that I am, I see the perfect storm. I say that in particular because I had the privilege of, of hosting the dean of my medical school at the University of Cape Town here a few months ago. And with that, I was able to expand my own mind and actually understand the assets that exist in this place. And the assets are profound. Most of us, though, sit in our silos. We don't understand exactly what those assets are. And so again, Bob, I have to congratulate you in bringing together this audience to actually have a discussion about what these assets might be and how we might leverage the collective wisdom of this group in order to unlock the assets and untrap it from the silos in which they, they currently reside. Within this perfect storm of British Columbia sits St. Paul's Hospital, as depicted on this famous painting by Tico Kerr. And this, at first glance, to many of the audience, might look like a rickety institution. But if you look closer, you'll actually understand that it's a, an institution which is breathing life, although admittedly it is somewhat short of breath. <laughs> <laughs> and it's also bursting at the seams with creative energy and with data which, if untrapped adequately, could actually be made to provide value which is not only transformative in the local domain, but transformative in the global sense. And in drawing up an inventory of e-health and telehealth at St. Paul's Hospital, and this is by no means a complete list, it includes things like the Rapid Access to Consultative Expertise, or the RACE program, developed by Scott Lear and his team, which has won global awards for expediting access to expert care. It includes thing like the, things like the, uh, like the renal paradigm, which is, be, which is being put together by Adair Levin. And I'll add that her paradigm isn't only about telemedicine, it's about system delivery, in fact, focused on, on First Nations community and bringing the, um, the, 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 the kidney the kidney team, I think it's, it's called, to, to the core face and, and, um, and, uh, and, and allowing access, irrespective of, um, of social economic class or location, to the best of breed. A wonderful concept. It's something that we might take for granted in this environment, but something that we ought not to, because it doesn't exist to this extent. And I can tell you this from first-hand experience in other parts of the world. And then mental health and addictions, the notions of, of being able to um, avoid bringing unsettled patients into an unsettled emergency department with predictable consequences, having virtual assessments. And in fact, this again speaks to the need of big data because in the process of doing that, one would have to be able to interface between disparate databases, social services databases, um, BPD databases, and there are pro projects underhand which Dick and others can speak to which, um, which will facilitate that, which we're excited about needing. HIV, and then not to forget the, uh, the St. Paul's Hospital Media Services Center, which beams live cases around the world and hosts video conferences. And so Doug, Doug Nichols sitting over here, um, great to have you part of this conversation as well, Doug. And that leads me to the construct that we put it together as we speak, which is this innovation network for consumer and connected health based at St. Paul's Hospital, which will essentially be a clearing house to take best practice and, and make it happen around the province and to serve as a template for doing this elsewhere. So we've done this with, uh, with, with bench to bedside, molecule to clinical practice. This fits perfectly into the paradigm of an academic health network of which St. Paul's will be a very important node, obviously, but just a node transmitting this expertise more broadly around the network, both locally in Vancouver and in the province and more widely on a global level. And just to play with this one, as we contemplate the landscape in, in British Columbia, um, I'm reminded that if healthcare is the black hole of the economy and LNG or, or, or natural resources is the opportunity, then why not link these? Why not utilize the electronic infrastructure within the pipelines that run through communities to actually transmit broadband information? And why not have a conversation about how we might actually change the paradigm from health simply being a cost center to health actually being a resource so that we can leverage and in fact, export. And so in concluding, this is a photograph of Clifton Beach, a famous beach in Cape Town. This is where I spent a large part of my medical school years <laughs> studying anatomy. <laughs> but this ultimately is why I went into, into medicine. 
And this is what drove my sensibilities in, in, in healthcare and the sensibilities as well of a large population of South African expatriates. I point out that 42% of rural GPs in British Columbia are South African. Um, and that, by the way, creates a huge opportunity. It's a networking opportunity through which we, can actually, which we collectively could leverage. All one has to do is show the Rugby World Cup next year and you'll have a, <laughs> you'll have a ready audience. And there are, there are several, British Columbia being the, the multi-ethnic uh, community that it is, there are several examples um, of, um, of expats and, and, and of, uh, of diaspora communities. I think of uh, Karima and, and the conversations we've had about, about Kenya and leveraging the opportunity to do real things. In fact, out of the Dean's conversation came a collaboration between the University of Cape Town and the CDRD. They have really visited here and, and it's, a, it's a conversation which now has real legs. And so the, the opportunity is really exciting. Um, I'll, I'll conclude, finally, with the old joke about why the Canadian crossed the road. Anyone know? To get to the middle. <laughs> it turns out though that the middle isn't a bad place to be, especially given the challenge of integrating. And if one can utilize creativity, technology, and data to integrate between impossible extremes, then we'll all be much further ahead. And to the extent that I presented the opportunity on a global level, let me just say that St. Paul's Hospital is a microcosm of those extremes. Here you have best of breed, high tech, with, urban, with complex urban health and addictions. And so we can utilize creativity, we can utilize the collective smarts in this room to create a conversation that can resonate, can change the nature of e-health and telemedicine around the world. Thanks very much. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'd like to invite down to the podium, Dr. John Pavlovich, um, Marie-Pierre Delaire, Anne-Marie Kahn, Emery is the clinical nurse specialist in the um, heart failure, particular cyst device and transplant program. We'll need to and Dick Vallette, CEO and president of the Supports Hospital Foundation. Well, so we're going to open this up for questions, but we're hoping this will stimulate even more dialogue because this is an exciting program. And basically what we're doing is we're asking you to, we're exposing ourselves, I guess. The king is without clothes. We want to tell you about the things we're passionate about, but we really need your help to focus it, put it into context. And I have to tell you, there's so many other great ideas in the organization. Out of the 50 plus that we submitted to you, these were the three that came there. But we haven't forgotten about all the others. We want to go forward. But this now is around improving patients' health intervention, adhering, uh, adherence using e-health and other technologies. What questions do you have for the group? You realize if you don't ask questions, I can't let you out for the break, so you can't use the restroom. So, <laughs> okay, one of our speakers, Tom. Great presentation. My, my question is this: We have the technology. We have, you know, you say the outreach posts and so forth. Why aren't we doing it? What What are the major barriers in implementing um, telemedicine, telehealth throughout the province tomorrow? So, um, in my view, there are no barriers in all except those that we put in, play in front of ourselves. And that's exactly what we're doing right now, start, starting with, our, with this construct, Dick, and maybe you can comment on this, mm -hmm. and continuing with this conversation. And I'll point out that telehealth, telehealth itself is not that innovative. I think we confuse innovation and modernization some of the time. And so, you know, and so, um, um, and, and as well, the other thing we confuse is taking risk by doing. Often we take risk by not doing more than we do by doing. And so I think we're there, Don. Um, um, just to point out that many people are doing this, and not uniquely at St. Paul's. People around the province are doing it. Um, it's, it it'll, it'll, it'll only accelerate with the um, generational change and, and with the advent of, um, of digital natives. And, and perhaps I can throw, I can open up the conversation to people in the audience. So John Waldron, um, who's enterprise um, manager for um, um, IMITS, is in the audience. And John is an innovator within, his, within, the, within IMITS and a great supporter of, um, of physician and user and clinician driven solutions. So John, maybe I can ask you to comment as well. Brendan Byrne uh, from TELUS, who made the, some comments earlier, is in the audience. So perhaps I can involve you, the two of you in, this, in that conversation. So sure, what do you think? What are the barriers? What are the challenges? And what can we do about those as an organization that's very interested in using evidence-based approaches to change the system. I can, uh, I can speak to the, uh, 
quite simply too many cooks in the kitchen from my experience. Um, okay. As we have valid ideas for change or valid ideas for innovation or something that will have tangible, meaningful benefit for a group, um, it often involves a lot more people at the table to actually implement the change or realize the change. And as you broaden that population, the more people you have to communicate with, it seems to become more and more challenging. And if you could okay. take the analogy of a, of a, a, a nice uh, commercial kitchen at a fine restaurant, if you had all, the, all chefs in the kitchen, that meal's going to taste awful. You know, the plate coming out, if it ever does make it out of the kitchen, would just look like a mess, as opposed to having sort of one visionary saying, this is, this is the solution, this is how I want it to look, this is how we need to get it out and everyone converging around that person or group to support the, uh, the implementation of the vision. So many times, so many meetings, so many great ideas come forward that are lightweight, that are small, that are easy and tangible, and uh, it just gets bogged down in the confusion of the, uh, as the crowd grows. Um, and it seems in our organizations, in our experience, uh, it, and not just unique in BC by any means, certainly across uh, large healthcare organizations in North America, we tend to um, put a big dollar price around the change. And those are the ones that attract the attention. And then it's more of a, an obligation to, to change as okay. opposed to incentive to change. Okay, so some important thoughts that we need to take into the context, realizing that you're going to help us select the topics that then go on for further discussion and brainstorming to actually formulate the research questions. So, yes. One, one of the challenges that, that I see is, you know, in Canada we've, you know, so, so I'm in an organization that's looking at things nationally. In Canada we've got, you know, 14 different kind of uh, you know, health governance structure, prevent, you know, provinces, territories, federal government. Uh, and it even gets you know, more complex when you get into local health regions, uh, everyone trying to do everything their, their, you know, their own way. Um, so you know, one of the things that you know, business has, has really been transformed by is lean startup methodologies and starting to look at where the value is and being very intentional about the pilots. Um, and that's something maybe somebody on the panel can, can comment whether they've, they've incorporated that. Okay. And, and one other comment, which is you know, I'm always struck by people saying that there's not enough money in the system to do things, yet we spend a hell of a lot of money. Uh, and I thought the first presentation identifying the economics of, you know, where the money's being spent, um, you know, we need some ways to translate, move that money from where it's being spent and wasted into places where we can spend it and innovate. Okay. So a couple thoughts there. Maybe if I ask the panel. Yes. Um, so I would say from my experience, uh, what I've seen is that there are two problems. Uh, the first one I would say is fragmentation. So as has been mentioned, the money is often uh, taken from different pockets for, let's say, uh, patient travel versus patient care versus uh, uh, different health authorities. So in my experience as a clinician, I have seen that, uh, for instance, if I'm seeing a patient in Northern Health Authority from Providence Healthcare, I run into uh, multiple uh, layers of paperwork of different health authority, different policies, which complexify my, my work a lot. And I think that the fact that um, telemedicine often encompasses uh, multiple instances is a big barrier to, uh, to it being uh, done efficiently. So um, then another, another one of the barrier is the economic um, fragmentation in the sense that uh, I could potentially by, by expediting, um, expediting care, having access to consultant, uh, save a lot of money to the whole system by preventing in unnecessary travels. Uh, but this is not seen as a safe uh, a saving cost measure. It is seen as a, a new cost for buying the equipment for doing the telemedicine, for instance, or for setting up the telemedicine office. Um, you know, the overhead are seen by Providence Healthcare, but the huge travel cost savings are not seen by the whole system. So I think these are two barriers. We're too fragmented, and we don't see. We lose sight of the big picture, basically. Okay. And with these great ideas, be thinking about what would the problems be like if we were to go ahead and try and solve these? How could we make a difference? Yes. I hope for dealing with my products. You know, uh, I've enjoyed all the presentations this morning. One of the things I think we're not talking enough about, I think Stephanie spent a lot of time about, just the efficiency of the health system. I think there's a lot of amazing innovations 
that don't get translated, <coughs> or even if we provide the evidence and there's solid evidence, don't get put into practical practice. So I think it's like the system needs a stent. I mean, it's just there's not enough efficiency of, of the flow through of the concepts, ideas, <coughs> into practical terms and into implementation. And the example that Dr. Rabinowitz gave just on, you know, on, on um, remote care that's available, uh, it's used less than in less than 10% of patients right now. It's been available for many years. It's not expensive, and it's still not used. So I think that I'd be interested in part of all of this if we can spend more time talking about efficiencies. I agree. There's more than enough money in the system. Right now, in terms of the Commonwealth, we're ranked uh, 9 out of 10 countries in terms of safety, 9 out of 10 countries in terms of access. I mean, we're missing the efficiency play here, I think, in terms of getting these things translated into practical terms. And I know in the UK, they've put in strategic care networks. In Alberta, they've put them in to try and get the knowledge transfer to actually flow through down to the patient. And I can't say it's been overly effective as of yet, but I would challenge the panel to discuss a little bit more about efficiency in the system and how we can get your ideas into practical terms. Okay, any thoughts, please? <clears throat> um, that's a really good point. I think uh, one of the big barriers that we've faced in terms of getting something from a, an idea or a concept through to clinical practice is fear. Um, people are just afraid that this is going to cause some horrific privacy breach. and. Um, for example, we're thinking about using FaceTime for people um, in palliative care who need a palliative care visit, um, but they're not well enough to even go to their local centre. And we thought, well, why not FaceTime? Like, let's try FaceTime and, and the palliative care NP or physician can talk to the patient. And uh, everyone's going, oh, you can't use FaceTime because... And so that idea just gets canned, and it's just such a simple, easy solution, and people are probably doing, doing it anyway. And every single patient I've asked in regards to using FaceTime have said, I love it, I think it's great, I don't care about the privacy risk, I want to talk to the doctor. Um, so I think we need to overcome that fear that there's going to be some horrific privacy breach. Um, I, think, I think as we start co-opting patients, the conversation about privacy will change, because, you know, currently, Many people die with their privacy intact, and that isn't necessarily a good thing. <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and as well, on the, on, on the issue of, um, of um, the silo mentality, firstly, I think a big data will provide a way of, of, of changing that conversation because one can then interface between different parts of government, for example, who own different parts of the problem. And the last point I'd make is that it's very hard to drive productivity in the system which, which doesn't have the right outcome and has global budgeting. Yeah, so the, point, the entire construct has to change in order to really make it meaningful to drive efficiency. Yeah, to that point, I think what's missing is motivators in the system. I think if we had an efficiency motivator uh, in terms of outcomes that was coming through, I mean, no one behaves outside of a motivation. So I think the system is missing a motivator to try and drive that through. And I think that's uh, where we have political will and all these kind of things that come into play. But I, I really think it's a, a lot of work to be done on the efficiency yeah. of how these ideas get to practical yeah. terms. Yeah. Yeah. A comment and then we'll come to another question. Thanks very much. So I'm John Polovich. I do um, primary care uh, outreach both in communities but also by telemedicine. And over the last four years I've switched my practice to three quarters virtual to a quarter of in-community work. Your, your point about um, efficiencies has everything to do with normalizing a behavior. And, and we're a long ways from normalizing telehealth, telemedicine into uh, the medical community for different reasons. Number one is uh, we, up until now, we've done very little teaching of students as they come through school, um, residency programs, and so forth. So we don't integrate uh, this kind of knowledge and skill set in their training so that they, they don't understand its a true application. Um, the barriers about then once you once you get out into into practice, <coughs> it's it's anything but easy to um, to carry on with uh, telemedicine in the sense of yes the technology has been around for a long time, but historically doctors have had to go to the basement of some hospital to um, sit in some dark room to connect to a remote community. That's not going to get it done. Um, I should say we're in the basement now. <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you saw that picture that Alan projected of uh, him himself and myself and a patient meeting in real time between a primary care uh, person, a consultant, and the patient, 
light bulb should have went on because when in healthcare does that ever happen? Almost never. But in a virtual world, it can happen all the time. And yet we don't build on that and that huge success. But you don't know how much effort it took to make that little triangle happen in that moment. So in my work, um, I just crested over the thousand patient, patient telehealth visit for 2014. Okay, last year in 2013, did about just short of 900. And so we've uh, been able to do over a thousand, just myself, of, of in a normalized environment, hitting buttons and toggling between communities um, to be able to provide access to the most needy population in the, in the country. So um, until we get to the point where uh, technology telemedicine is as normalized as a telephone, when you go to work, you don't think about the telephone. You don't think of it as being an integral part of your work, and that's where we need to get to. If we, I always remind people, and it was a great point you, you made about um, security and privacy. I mean, this is arguably the most um, important piece of technology that, that holds up healthcare around the world. Um, without cell phones, um, the whole house of cards would come tumbling down. We use it every day, from ICUs to reaching out to patients. And why do we do that? Because it's, it's seamless, it's immediate, it's responsive. So as I was talking today, I was already taking calls from a remote community and helping the patient who actually you saw on the screen, I was actually texting him in, in his other community about his heart condition. So that's how easy, that's the efficiency that we're talking about. Um, the cell phone is not secure in any way. And why not? Because the system hasn't advanced to the point. So the train has indeed left the station. And um, patients want the service. We could do this if, if we want to, but uh, Marie-Pierre um, correctly pointed out there are multiple jurisdictional barriers that prevent us from <coughs> moving forward. And my last point, sorry, then I'll shut up. Um, I, I, I see a great opportunity here to uh, build on Alan's suggestion of bundling a whole um, box full of great services that St. Paul's delivers for certainly the patients that I work with around the remote corners of the province, um, you have a great opportunity here to do something very special. Okay, we're gonna have one more question, but I have to tell you actually the most important thing isn't the iPhone, it's the rubber band that holds that iPhone on because my iPhone keeps falling off. <laughs> I think uh, Dr. Montana had a question, or, or a comment? Yes, I, I, um, I, I was a little disappointed that, uh, that you build on the issue of key health and did not address the elephant in the room. Is we, we still today don't have electronic medical records that, that can serve as a fundamental piece to build all of this. Uh, this is a safety concern. Uh, this is an efficiency concern. Uh, uh, we are putting ourselves and our patients at risk uh, because we are not able to understand uh, what antiretroviral te therapy that patient was taking 10 years ago, five years ago, seven years ago. And all of that is critically uh, important to make decisions today. Uh, so in the absence of that, all of this is great, but it's, it's going to be built in foundations with, 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 with sand blocks that uh, are really not sustainable and not uh, strong enough to hold it the way it should. So I, I wasn't speaking about it because I'm tired of headbanging. Well, <laughs> but I, I, you know, I think we're, we're talking about innovation. Let, we need to start with the, where, where the game starts. No, that, that's right. The, the um, I mean, EMRs are simply data repositories. Um, and the essential data repositories, and we are making progress, but it's way too slow, and it's, and it's way behind most jurisdictions in the world. The game changer will, uh, again, I believe, be linkage between those data silos to one another. So it's pointless having a, a GP EMR in, in Sir Latin First Nations that can't speak to the, the EMR at St. Paul's Hospital, for instance. And so if we want to get real about having a conversation, then we ought to do that. And we have the solutions. We can execute on it right away. We don't have to be continuing to have conversations. We can make it happen. And I think that's part of what I'm trying to get to here. Conversations are talk is cheap. And action is everything. And as Paul said to us when we first met, I can tell you or I can show you. And let's, let's do something. Let's show people how to do it. OK, we're going to wrap up with, I guess, one last comment. No, I, was on, on the EMR uh, electronic health records, I think we have TELUS in, in the room. So maybe they can tell you a little bit about what their vision is about how they can help uh, you know, accelerate innovation in the province and in Canada, for that matter. OK, any last comment? Or do you want to save that for the brainstorming session? Sounds good.